This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. Um, we are going to call the meeting to order and then move immediately into uh, the state of the town addresses. So let me start this by saying Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town council meeting. I will call upon each counselor by name and at that time they should unmute and say they are present and then mute again. This is also how we will conduct uh, questions later on in the general meeting when you raise your hand. I'm also going to call on a couple other special guests who are with us this evening and part of the state of the town to make sure that they can also hear and be heard. Um, so given that we have a quorum of the council, I'm going to call the council meeting to order at 633. Let me start with the roll. Um, Alyssa. Present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Darcy Dumont. Present. Lynn Griesmer. Present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Dorothy Pam. Present. Evan Ross. Present. George Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. And Shalini Palmilm. Present. I'd also like to make sure that the following people can hear me and we can hear them. Uh, Paul Bockelman. Present. Uh, Allison McDonald. Present. And Austin Surratt. And also Present. to point out that we're joined this evening by Superintendent Dr. Mike Morris and also Library Director Sharon Sherry. Um, this is an evening that begins with the state of the town, which is a prescription of the charter. And I'm going to begin. And then after that, Paul Bockelman will follow me. After that, we'll be the chair of the school committee, Allison McDonald, and then we'll move on to library trustee president, Austin Surratt. So can we have the slides, please? So welcome. This is the second state of the town address. It continues to be an honor and a privilege to serve as president of the Amherst Town Council for our second year. I enjoy the challenge. Next slide, please. Our speakers tonight, as I mentioned before, are Paul Bachman, Allison McDonald, and Austin Surratt. Next slide, please. And let me just say that this is an address, as I mentioned before, required by section 2.2 of the charter. Next slide, please. The Amherst Town Council is a group of, outstand of 13 people. They are outstanding in many ways, very talented, individual, and independently minded. Our at-large counselors are Alyssa Brewer, Mandy Jo Haneke, and Andy Steinberg. Our District 1 counselors are Kathy Shane and Sarah Schwartz. Pat DeAngelis joins me in representing District 2. District 3 is represented by Dorothy Pam and George Ryan. And District 4 is represented by Evan Ross and Steve Schreiber. Representing District 5 are Shalini Balmilm and Darcy Dumont. Now more than ever, each brings an important set of values and perspectives much needed in this town. Each counselor strives to represent those who are not apparent in the body of the council. And while a virtual meeting limits how we are able to recognize people, I ask that you let them know of your appreciation in the same way that you let them know about issues that are important to you. Next slide, please. Fulfilling 
the requirements of the charter. The council continues to fill the requirements of the charter and we continue to take notes about what we would like to change. Upon recommendation of the planning board, we adopted the master plan this year, thus fulfilling one of the charter requirements. We have held public forums on the budget and the master plan and other public forums required when we intend to spend money off cycle, such as the purchase of a new energy efficient ambulance that allows for less emissions during standing at the hospital and other places. Each district council has, that counselor has held no fewer than two district meetings and the at-large counselors are often present at the district meetings. There's no doubt that this year, this year has presented a major challenge that has defined all of us, but with the leadership of our town manager, Paul Bockelman, our outstanding clerk of the town council, Athena O'Keefe, and our very adept information technology staff, we rapidly moved to meeting virtually as of Monday, March 16, 2020. As of the end of December this year, we will have met 44 times this year in regular meetings, joint meetings, and with the library and schools, four town meetings, committees of the whole, public forums, and hearings. 37 of those meetings have been virtual. We look forward to seeing you all in person again. And that does not include town council committee meetings. We recognize and we reorganized our four standing committees and continue as members of the joint capital planning committee along with the schools and library. And individual counselors are liaisons to eight town committees and all are available to any committees. Well, next slide, please. While the challenges of this year have limited in-person meetings, counselors are regularly in contact with residents through email, phone, Facebook, news newsletters, and yes, text messages. While we have been, not been able to gather on the town steps to read proclamations since March of 2020, the council continues to pass proclamations, resolutions, and attend numerous virtual meetings. One outstanding example is the resolution before the town council this evening, a resolution affirming the town of Amherst's commitment to end structural racism and achieve racial equity for black residents. To the extent possible, we continue to attend events and meetings of other organizations, virtually of course, and on rare occasion outside socially distanced and with masks on. Next slide. Despite the special challenges of the year, the council has had some notable accomplishments. Next slide. They include passage of the percent for art bylaw, the wage and tip theft bylaw, the responsible employer public construction contracts and agreements for tax relief bylaw, and prohibiting the use of wild and exotic animals in traveling shows and circuses. In addition to that, we have made amendments to the open container bylaw, the single use of plastic bags, and noise violations. Next slide, please. We've taken some specific acts, actions to support local businesses and farmers. They include adoption of a temporary zoning amendment and changes to the public way policy, allowing more rapid approval and flexible use of outdoor space for retail and dining in the downtown and village centers. We approved a plan for the farmer's market to use the town commons, thus providing a safe and welcoming environment for one of the town's brightest events every week on Saturdays and for farmers, one of the most profitable. And we've addressed other public way requests, helping local builders move their plans forward. Next slide, please. We didn't just do our budget once this year, we did it twice. We did a 112 budget and then an annual budget. And during the annual budget, we froze two police positions, 
which has forged the way to the appointment of the community safety working group by the town manager. Thus far, we have not dipped into our reserves to balance the budget. And while it includes limited capital dollars, we continue to improve our roads and sidewalks. Our audit as usual indicates sound financial management. Next slide. Right after the state of the town address last year, Amherst was accepted into the Mass School Business Authority program to build or renovate and repair one elementary school. We have accepted a gift that allows us to make significant renovations and in addition to the North Amherst Library. And we broke ground on the dog park, cut the ribbon on Groff Park, and the plans to build a playground at Kendrick Park continue forward. In the area of affordable housing, we have continued to support the renovation and construction of affordable studio apartments at 132 Northampton Road. But stay tuned. Next slide. We heard from many of you as we looked at polling places. And that led us to ensure safe access. With significant resident input, developed, we developed and improved a polling location plan that provided for safe conduct of the presidential primary and general elections. And we proudly certify our results as accurate and without any evidence of fraud. Next slide, please. The future and our challenges. As we move forward, we are facing several significant challenges. These are reflected in the town manager's performance goals and include addressing community safety, racial equity, and social justice, identifying a path forward for our four major capital investments, adopting a climate action plan to help us reach our goals, and supporting the economic recovery and vitality of Amherst. Our goals include, also include continuing to pass responsible capital and operating budgets, review and revising zoning bylaws, and the adoption of a comprehensive housing plan. Other pending bylaws that you'll see include water, sewer, surveillance technology, and facial recognition. And finally, continuing to make the counselor's job more manageable. Next slide, please. We bring to a close the comments this evening. Please allow me to focus on and thank the town manager and our outstanding town staff, as well as other others. During this challenging time, you were still protected by our first responders, police, fire, EMS, and the Department of Public Works. The streets were plowed, you received water and sewer services, you were able to vote, pay your taxes, get a dog license, or a building permit. In other words, our town staff kept the place moving forward despite the pandemic. In August, we evaluated the town manager's performance with input from residents, committees, staff, and all counselors. Paul Bachman was hired in 2016, and, during his, and he is now in his second contract with the town. He instills confidence in local government. And this has never been more demonstrated as he addressed the impact of COVID-19. Never missing a beat, he did not hesitate to make the moves necessary to keep, keep the town operational yet safe. When push came to shove, he challenged the university about their plans for returning students leading to significant positive responses from UMass and weekly meetings between the town and the university. Continuing to serve as clerk of the council is Athena O'Keefe. She is simply outstanding. Need to find something, she can. Without hesitation, she helps all of us stay on track, track never missing a beat. And we also wanna recognize the many town committees and residents that serve on them. And the staff who also work with those committees. We have learned lessons from this period of virtual meetings that we need to examine carefully and along with those committees, incorporate them into our future meetings once we return in person. The members of our town committees apply to be on our committees. They get interviewed. 
They share their expertise in areas such as personnel, water supply and contaminants, energy and climate action, housing, etc. On behalf of the town council and the town of Amherst, we thank you for your past and ongoing service, your willingness to provide us with sound advice and to put up with our sometimes far ranging questions. We really want to particularly acknowledge the planning board, the board of health and the board of license commissioners. This year, the planning board and the board of health helped move special legislation or passing special regulations to help our businesses and protect our residents. residents. And once again, we recognize the board of license commissioners for assisting businesses during these challenging times. Two other serious notes of appreciation go to Amherst Media for work working with us to bring meetings into residents' home with the added feature such as displaying the names of those who are in the audience. And to our residents, we have helped Amherst through these challenging times. Thank you and please continue to follow all guidance regarding gatherings, masks, social distancing, and public health. As I close on the next slide, a few, few final observations. Nowhere in any of our election materials, speeches, or panels, did we ever state or were we ever asked how we would respond as an elected official to a pandemic, but we did. And Amherst continues to move forward. The charter continues to be an outstanding document providing guidance to even the most obscure issues. We value the many ways in which we hear from our residents, ask that you continue to tell us when something is wrong and when we get it right. Be being president of the council means balancing one's democratic ideals and the need for leadership. The council keeps me in line but more, most important to remember is we are all elected and each person has one vote. We stand as equals. Leadership means hearing and seeking solutions. Please let your counselors know that you appreciate them and recognize the dedication they each bring to this important role in our community. We're going to move on to town, to town manager, Paul Bachman who joined us in 2016. And rather than go into a lengthy introduction, I'm going to have Paul go right ahead. Thank you, Lynn. So this is a different sort of state of the town speech um, than we did even, not that we have a long tradition, but we have one year of tradition. And But this, there's no pomp, there's no circumstance. It's just another Zoom meeting with people in little boxes talking to people who are at home on their computers most likely scanning the internet or reviewing email, I see you. So I'm sure it'll be a cliche pretty soon to say that 2020 was a year like no other. And while I continue to see uh, challenges, especially during the next three to four months, I believe there are reasons for optimism. So next slide. But first, let's go back. A year ago, re I reported on the accomplishments of 2019 and the advent of the new town council. We were discussing bold new initiatives like Destination Amherst, which would bring renewed attention to the tired centerpiece of our downtown, the North Common, the construction of a privately funded performing arts show and possibly a new garage and a new play structure and other improvements in Kendrick Park. Each of these projects were to be funded by a combination of state grants, private gifts and investments, business support, Community Preservation Act funds and town funds. Uh, there were other initiatives in the pipeline, affordable housing on Northampton Road, residential developments on Southeast Street, University Drive Extension and Spring Street. The university was preparing to make significant new investments in its residential housing stock. We had just received word, as, as Lynn Bench mentioned, that the Massachusetts School Building Authority had agreed to fund a new elementary school in Amherst. Things were moving forward and long overdue needs were being addressed. Then COVID hit. Many of these projects and initiatives were put on hold. Priorities were reordered, town staff were redeployed, and all of our focus was on responding to this once in a century emergency. But, and, th and this may sound strange to you, I've never seen town staff more adaptable or perform better than in the past nine months during this pandemic crisis. It was early March. I had called a department heads meeting. 
we've covered our normal updates, but the focus of the meeting was this unknown virus and the limited knowledge we had of it at that time. I said to those in the room that this was likely the last time we would all be together in person for a very long time. I actually didn't really mean it. I mostly said it for dramatic effect to drive the seriousness of the situation home, but unfortunately it turned out to be true. By then our COVID response or what I call core team was meeting regularly. At first it was twice a week, but by mid-March we were meeting every morning, seven days a week. There was so much information to process, resources to marshal, staff to manage, and so many decisions to make. We followed basic emergency management principles of incident command and force protection, i.e. making sure our command structure was clear and employees were safe and healthy, healthy so they could deliver the services the public needed. And we established operating principles, such as relying on the most recent science to, deform our, to inform our decision making. And lastly, we were explicit to honor the value of forgiveness. We were all making decisions quickly and with incomplete information. We had to be resilient and that required forgiveness. Although the scheduled decision-making uncertainty and sheer volume of work was grueling, there was great comfort, camaraderie and mutual support among the team. Next slide. I wanna recognize the core team by name because their work and commitment to the town was simply outstanding. Fire Chief and Emergency Management Director Tim Nelson, Police Chief Scott Livingstone, Public Works Superintendent Guilford Mooring, Interim Finance Director and Comptroller Sonia Aldridge, Assistant Town Manager David Zomack, and providing leadership and subject area expertise was Health Director Julie Fetterman. Julie has since retired and didn't really get to have a retirement party, but her knowledge and ability to provide a framework for decision making were crucial at this stage of the pandemic. I relied on her judgment good cheer, and let's get this solved mentality, even if it was sometimes delivered with some salty language. Working together with Superintendent of Schools Mike Morris and Library Director Sharon Sherry, I want you all to know that the town was well served by these dedicated professionals. Next slide. One of the most vexing challenges was that of the most vulnerable members of our community, those without housing, who we quickly realized had no options if they had to quarantine at home because they had no home. We worked many hours developing options to find suitable housing. None worked out until Hampshire College stepped forward. When so many others could see only reasons not to act, Hampshire's president, Ed Wingenbeck said, these are members of our community. They're in need. Of course we'll help. Let's get started. You remember actions like this in a time of crisis. Next slide. In responding to the pandemic, the sheer number of initiatives undertaken by the town is impressive. Everything from emergency rental assistance for those who could not pay their rent to a range of actions designed to support local businesses. Many of these ideas came from the tireless creativity of the leaders of the chamber in the bid. We worked with the university and pushed back when we felt it necessary to ensure that bringing students back to the town would be done safely, both for the students and for the general population. I'm pleased to note that our ongoing relationship is steady and durable. Next slide. Every town department stepped up during the crisis, every single one. The communications manager organized and has hosted 33 community chats. These are the weekly call-in shows where callers can ask me or any of our guests, uh, Superintendent Morris was on last week, any questions that they want. And we continue the monthly cup of Joe, albeit virtually at this point. And this, this, we have another one coming up on Friday at eight o'clock. Next slide. In addition to these initiatives, some of them are listed here. Um, staff continued the work we were hired to do. A new playground across park opened, ground was broken on a new dog park. We continued to new, move forward with the purchase of the Hickory Ridge Golf Course. An anonymous donor has promised to fund an addition to the North Amherst Library. Next slide. Town staff quickly implemented policies designed to sustain our residents and business community. The planning department shepherded the affordable housing on Northampton Road through the comprehensive permitting process and reviewed and approved several other projects. Next slide. The town clerk's office put on two major elections under new rules, utilizing social distancing protocols and dealing with a tortured national election process and the acting town clerk secured a foundation grant to ensure our election workers were safe. The IT staff has set up dozens of employees so they can work remotely if needed. LSSE, now Recre Amherst Recreation, totally transformed their operations, taking on new tasks and doing jobs normally done by summer help. Next slide. 
The town was incredible at securing grants. You're not going to read them all here because there's so many. With the largest being the most the recently announced 1.5 million Mass Works grant to improve Pomeroy Village and its intersection. We've raised millions of dollars through aggressive fund, fundraising through grants. Next slide. The finance, finance department prepared, and as Lynn said, the town council reviewed and passed two budgets for the FY21 fiscal year, a 112 budget, then a full year budget. Next slide. As we close the books on FY20, despite the challenges of COVID-19, we were able to finish the year with a positive balance as staff were able to offset unforeseen expenses with spending controls, federal support, and careful management. Even though revenues are down, our finances are solid as we have made the hard choices to manage the taxpayers' funds wisely. Next slide. We've faced many challenges this year and in the years ahead. Fortunately, we are well situated to withstand these difficulties and at this point to make progress on the many needs that we all recognize we must address. The uncertainty creates a difficult environment for all of our budgets. Next slide. Our entire operation is predicated on a strong financial foundation and we are rock solid, but we must be vigilant to maintain this solid footing. We face many challenges moving forward. We have taken on the job of improving community safety to, to ensure that we live in a community that is safe for black and brown people. We stay committed to making the town a leader in sustainability by taking steps to move forward on climate action initiatives. Next slide. This year has been energizing and exhausting. Moments of frustration and disappointment have been offset time and again with flashes of selflessness and genuine acts of kindness. In spite of all this, or, or more accurately because of all this, I am pleased to report that the state of the town is strong. I appreciate the opportunity to serve you and the people of Amherst. I'm privileged to work with an incredible staff. I love living and working and being part of this special community. And I appreciate the progressive intelligent governance provided by the town council and most directly the leadership and guidance provided by Town Council President Lynn Driesmer. I thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank you, Paul. We're going to move on to Allison McDonald. Allison moved to Amherst 18 years ago, choosing Amherst for the strong reputation of its public schools. She is a communications and marketing professional and since 2015 has worked with the Hadley-based national nonprofit VentureWell. Over the years, she has volunteered with the parent PGO at Fort River and helped out with her son's youth sports events. After serving on the district's enrollment working group in 1917, I mean in 2017, I'm sorry, Allison, you're not that old. Um, Allison was elected to the school committee in 2018 she is now serving as chair for both the Amherst and the regional school committees. Allison, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, you could go to the next slide, please. Amherst Public Schools host a diverse and engaged student body that leads in our communities in many ways, including through political and civic advocacy, gardening programs, community enrichment, performing arts, academics, and cultural events. This school year has placed many new demands on all of us, including learning new ways of teaching and learning. We are proud of our students, educators, staff, and volunteers for their efforts, their many efforts in the face of these challenges. Next slide, please. Amherst has three public schools that serve nearly 1,000 students in grades K through six and an additional 32 students in pre-K. Our three schools, Wildwood, Fort River, and Crocker Farm, are roughly similar in size and demographics. Our student population is highly diverse and more than half are Black, Indigenous, or other people of color. Half of our students are high needs as defined by the State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESE. One in three are economically disadvantaged and more than one in five have disabilities. Our elementary school budget for the current year is $23.9 million. Next slide, please. We enjoy a strong statewide reputation for all of our public schools, a legacy that our community values and prioritizes. A few highlights in our elementary schools include the district consistently meets state progress and accountability goals, though persistent gaps remain among our high need students and other groups. 
We provide art, music, and technology education through weekly specials classes, as well as through integration into grade level unit studies. And we enjoy low average class sizes to promote learning and a student teacher ratio of approximately nine to one. Next slide. Amherst is one of four member towns in a regional school district with two secondary schools. The Amherst Regional Middle School serving grades seven and eight and the Amherst Regional High School serving grades nine through 12. The schools serve a total of 1,283 students from the four towns, Amherst, Pelham, Leverett, and Shutesbury. Our student population in the regional schools is also highly diverse and nearly half are BIPOC. Nearly half of the students are high needs as defined by DESE with nearly one in three being economically disadvantaged and more than one in five having disabilities. Our secondary schools budget for the current fiscal year is $32.1 million. Next slide. Like our elementary schools, our regional schools enjoy an excellent reputation thanks to our dedicated and high quality educators, staff and administrators. Our schools provide strong community and school programs that support student well-being and social emotional health including our Family Center, the Bright Program, and Restorative Practices. We prioritize smaller class sizes that promote learning. Our schools provide high quality in-district specialized programs for our intensive special needs students, and we offer a wide array of electives, clubs, and sports, which together which define the rich character of our regional schools. Next slide. Looking a little deeper at our budgets, our current year budget of $23.9 million included a total net reduction of over $700,000 versus what was needed to provide the same level of services a year ago. Next slide. Looking at next fiscal year, the draft budget proposed in November is a reduction from this year and is level funded versus 2019-20. This would be a $1.4 million less than what is needed to provide services level to our 2019-2020 school year and would mean permanent cuts to those level services. Next slide. Taking a look at the regional schools budget, the current year budget of $32.1 million includes a total net reduction versus a level services budget of over $800,000. The town of Amherst funds $16.4 million of that budget. Level funding in 21-22 would be nearly $1.7 million in what is needed to provide services at the same level as 2019-2020 and would mean dramatic and permanent cuts that would fundamentally change our regional schools. Next slide. Student enrollment in our elementary schools has been declining in recent years and declines this year during the pandemic were steeper than prior trends. The district recently surveyed families who have left the schools and the presentation of results are available on the school committee webpage. Next slide. The proportion of our students in elementary schools who are high needs grew this year and is comparable to the overall trends in the state. Next slide. Our elementary student population is more diverse than the state average. Next slide. Similar to the trend in our elementary schools, regional schools student enrollment declines were steeper in the current year. And the results from that survey are also in, in the same presentation on the website. Next slide. Regional school student population is roughly comparable to the state averages with regard to needs. Next slide. And our regional student population is comparable to the state averages with regard to diversity. Next slide. Both districts and our communities have prioritized increasing the diversity within our staff. With support from our participation in the Minority Student Achievement Network, or MSAN, which is a national coalition of multiracial school districts that have come together to understand and eliminate opportunity and achievement gaps that persist in their schools, as well as teacher diversification grants from the state, the district has realized a 47% increase in BIPOC staff in, since 2015. Those staff now represent 28% of our total staff, up from 19% in 2015. Next slide. Looking forward, here are some of the key initiatives and challenges we are focusing on this year. With Pandemic Learning Plan, we developed a robust plan that prioritized in-person learning, yet, uh, yet it is unclear when students will return to the buildings. Going into next year, 
we will need to focus additional support to address the learning loss and academic deficits that are exacerbated by this extended period of distance learning. As mentioned earlier by others, we were accepted last year into the MSBA program to support a new elementary school building to replace Fort River and Wildwood. And um, as the pandemic restrictions are lifted and we return to full in-person learning, we will face significant space challenge space challenges at those two schools, Fort River and Wildwood, due to COVID alterations that effectively eliminated half the learning and working rooms in those schools, including the rooms where specials are taught. Third, we are facing significant budget pressure this year following the cuts made with up to meet level funding and further pressure in the coming school year due to the increased needs and the further cuts needed to meet level funding going into next year. On a brighter note, we built off of a highly successful first year of the Caminantes dual language program at Fort River and expanded this year to 36 kindergarten and 38 first grade students. Next slide, please. Additional goals we are working on this year include social and emotional well being of our students and staff, defining post pandemic education, and continuing to work to increase teacher and staff diversity work that will be supported by another state teacher diversification grant of $110,000 that was recently awarded to the district. Next slide. And finally, we expect to complete and report on two studies in the coming year, one on the viability and implications of moving sixth grade to the middle school, and one on expanding access to early childhood education in Amherst. Last slide. We thank you for your support and we invite you all to share your questions with me and my colleagues on the school committee or with Superintendent Dr. Morris and our email addresses are on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison. It's informative. Um, Austin Sarek will now be providing remarks on behalf of the Jones Library Trustees. He is a professor and administrator at Amherst College, where he has been for 46 years. He has served in a variety of other capacities, including the Zoning Board of Appeals, as well as the Board of the Common School and a volunteer at Amherst Neighbors. I'm going to stop with that, Austin, and let you go ahead, please. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to address uh, the council and my colleagues and the citizens of Amherst. I present this report on behalf of the Jones Library at the end of what clearly has been a very challenging year. To say that 2020 has been marked by uncertainty, fear, loneliness, and loss is to name just the obvious psychological and sociological and personal facts of this pandemic year. A perhaps less, less obvious fact is how important library services has been during um, the pandemic. Following town guidelines, our buildings closed, yet town libraries remained open via online access. Library services and programs have been lifelines for the old and the young, the well-off and the disadvantaged, longtime residents and those who are new to the community. Our services have connected town residents to each other, to library staff, and to the vital resources that the library provides. If 2020 is indeed rightly characterized by uncertainty, fear, loneliness, and loss, other words, resiliency, creativity, invention, devotion, indeed, dare I say, courage, are the appropriate ways to name the work done by our library director and her wonderful staff. Never has Sharon Sherry's ebullience, optimism, and can-do spirit been more in evidence and more necessary. Without her, the library's considerable achievements this year would have been impossible. So as Sharon herself would say, a huge shout out to Sharon and her staff. And thanks also to my fellow trustees, Bob Pam, Alex Lefebvre, Lee Edwards, Tammy Ely, and Chris Hoffman. They have provided a steady hand as the library has had to navigate the challenges of 2020. 
and they've kept their eyes on the future, making sure that planning for the much needed and long overdue renovation and expansion of the Jones would be brought to fruition, thanks to each of them. Now, let me say briefly a word about the day-to-day -day work of the libraries this year. During COVID closure, our overall circulation dropped by 14%. That in itself is not a surprise. Still, our staff has received and responded to more than 1,000 requests for materials each week and has sent 500 items a week through interlibrary loan to other libraries around the state. Our library staff has gone out of its way to call and reach out to patrons who they knew to be regular users of the library in order to apprise them of ways that they could continue to access library holdings. And if patrons could not come to the buildings during library hours, staff have accommodated and made deliveries to them. Not surprisingly, the number of items we delivered uh, has doubled in comparison with last year. And our fabulous reference department has been similarly busy answering inquiries from residents. We've expanded our digital resources and moved several in-person services online including library card application and renewal. We've also launched a print from home service for patrons who in the past were able to come into the library to print. And we've expanded our Wi-Fi hotspot lending program. Last year, we had 10 hotspots to lend, this year, 30. And COVID has certainly affected how the library expended its funds this year. Because patrons were required to stay home starting in March, the library focused much of its purchasing on e-content rather than physical items. And operations and maintenance expenses increased by 37% and 8% respectively due to the need for extra cleaning supplies and PPE once the building reopened. Utility costs, on the other hand, decreased by 28% uh, due to the closure. Since March, the library staff has done a truly remarkable job moving programming online. They've created a series of interviews with the local authors. These interviews have been live streamed on Facebook and have introduced viewers to recently published titles in fiction, nonfiction, and children's literature, all from distinguished authors in our community. The children's nonfiction book discussion group continues, as does our very popular Sing With Your Little One. And our new Civics and Democracy series provides monthly programs to help people understand both the virtues and challenges associated with participation in democratic government. Our English as a Second Language has also successfully adapted to the COVID world. Conversation circles have continued, which was important because our ESL students were isolated linguistically as well as socially during this year. And our community can be particularly proud that two ESL students have, been, uh, have gained citizenship this year. And every week, remarkably, library staff went to the Amherst Farmers Market where people could use a laptop, sign up for library cards, or indeed borrow some craft kits. Since last spring, the library has been busy working on an anti-racism agenda, coordinating with townwide efforts to ensure that we tear down all barriers to equal and dignified treatment of all Amherst residents. But in all of this work, we've had to cope with the serious inadequacies of the Jones Building. Our special collections department again sustained damage resulting from an HVAC system long in need of replacement. And COVID has further highlighted the building's shortcomings. Among other things, the Jones, rooms in the Jones are too small to have multiple people in them, and our HVAC system may not provide an acceptable air exchange rate. During this year, the trustees completed all needed steps to present the town council with, the, with what we regard as a compelling renovation and expansion plan a plan that will help the library be adequate to the work it does for all residents 
but especially for our most vulnerable citizens. This plan will move the Jones from being one of the least sustainable facilities in Amherst to making it a national model for sustainability. And let me be clear, no one will derive greater benefit from our plan to renovate and expand the library than the disadvantaged and dispossessed in our community. They rely on the library, its hospitality and its space. And what we've been able to provide them in the past has been barely adequate to their needs. And we can learn from the experience of almost every neighboring community which has renovated and expanded their library about the importance of those renovations and expansion to the disadvantaged and the dispossessed. The trustees decided to ask the town council to vote on our proposal by the end of April, realizing full well the fiscal challenges that Amherst now faces. We did so for multiple reasons not the least of which was because we expect to be formally awarded a state grant in July of 2021. And lest it be forgotten or simply taken for granted, the library had to do an enormous amount of work to prepare for and submit and succeed in winning the state grant. Taking advantage of the state funding is a once in a decade opportunity. We've asked the town council to vote by the end of April because we are convinced that we have a sound and feasible plan for financing the project. We did so in addition because the serious maintenance issues and structural problems which plague the Jones urgently need to be addressed. We've asked the council to vote on our plan because the alternative to a renovation and expansion saves very little money and is clearly inferior. As requested by the town council, we investigated the cost of repairing the existing building and found that it would cost between 14 and $16 million simply to repair the building and make it accessible as required by law. This is close to the amount the town would have to contribute to achieve a renovated, expanded, accessible, and sustainable Jones Library. We asked the town council to vote on our proposal by the end of April because delay risks both, both an escalation in cost and further deterioration in the building. We did so because children, teens, English language learners, immigrants, disadvantaged people, students of Amherst history, families, book lovers, and all those who flock to the Jones deserve a facility that is as inspiring as their dreams. But most importantly, we did so because in these dark and dangerous times, we do not want to put the future on hold. A renovated and expanded Jones will, we believe, be a beacon of hope and a reminder that a great town deserves a great library. We look forward to working closely with the town council as it determines when and how to consider our plan and our request. But remember what I said about this year of uncertainty, fear, loneliness, and loss. During this year, we were reminded yet again that Amherst libraries are among the town's most important facilities. Indeed, history teaches that libraries have always, always played a critical role in disaster recovery, whether in the Depression or following Katrina or in communities devastated by hurricanes. Post COVID, residents of the town who've been cooped up and confined will no doubt eagerly return to the Jones, the Munson and the soon to be expanded North Amherst Library, appreciating all the more the chance to take advantage of the democratic spaces they provide. And as we all know, public libraries, in fact, one of the last free spaces in the United States where vulnerable populations can seek out unemployment assistance, have internet and computer use, and daytime shelter from the streets. In conclusion, 2020 has shown us again that Amherst libraries aren't only in the business of books, they're in the business of building, serving, sustaining, and strengthening our community. 
Thanks so much. Thank you for your comments, Austin. Um, I want to just acknowledge that uh, joining us tonight, at least on the um, website through uh, Zoom, are several members of the school committee and the library trustees. I also want to mention that in the packet that's available for the meeting tonight is both the annual report from the schools, the library, and also the annual report from Carol Gray, who is the Oliver Smith elector, and also Doug Slaughter, who is chair of the Board of License Commissioners, and also Michael Burkhart for the Amherst Housing Authority. And with that, we're going to now conclude our uh, part of the tonight's meeting that is in fact the state of the town and move on to the regular meeting of the town council. Thank you for joining us for this part. <laughs>